This is the story of American Airlines Flight 1. If you're from the States, you may have flown on American Airlines Flight 1. Today, American Airlines Flight 1 is a flight between JFK and LAX. It's flown by a 777. But back in 1962, the same route was being flown by a Boeing 707. I didn't plan for this to happen. It just happened by chance. But I'm writing this on the 1st of March, 2021. And this incident takes place on the 1st of March, 1962, exactly 59 years ago. I just thought that was interesting. So, on that day, the 707 was prepped for its transcontinental flight. The plane had 95 people on board, 8 crew members, and 87 passengers. The crew studied their departure. They had to thread the needle on this one. They couldn't just power up and climb out. There were noise restrictions in and around New York. So they had to keep the power at a setting where they had a healthy safety margin, but quiet enough where they followed the rules. So with that, they taxied to runway 31 left. They were cleared for an IFR flight to LA. The controller added, In the interest of noise abatement, do not delay the turn to heading 290, end quote. Flight 1 was ready to go. The advanced power and the controller watched the plane as they took off 5,000 feet down the runway. As the plane started its climb, the pilots put the plane into a gentle left bank, as the controller had told them to. The controller turned their attention back to their scope. They asked Flight 1 to contact departure control. The plane started another left turn, and the controller monitored the plane's progress on their scope. The departure controller watched as the plane made a second left turn onto 140 degrees. The controller gave out radar vectors as they did for all planes but the radar blip that represented Flight 1 went off the scopes, and it never reappeared. Flight 1 had crashed into the shallow waters off of Jamaica Bay in New York. No one on board had survived. On the ground, people had a clear view of what the plane went through. The takeoff was normal. The plane climbed and started the noise abatement procedure by turning to the left. It then rolled out of its left turn to begin its next left turn. The left turn served two purposes. It would take the plane away from crowded areas, thus reducing the noise. It would also keep the plane out of the way of planes, landing or taking off from LaGuardia. The second left turn started out like any other turn, but the turn kept getting sharper and sharper. Soon, the plane was in a 90-degree right bank, and the nose dropped. The witnesses watched on as the plane entered a near-vertical dive, and that's how the plane impacted the water. Maybe something went wrong with the left turn. The investigators of the Civil Aviation Board looked for signs of incapacitation in the pilots. Tests disproved that. The pilots were all right. But these investigators had an uphill battle ahead of them. Part of the flight data from the flight data recorder was unrecoverable, as the foil that housed the data was torn very badly. But the flight data did tell them something. Most of the flight had been nothing but ordinary. The takeoff and the initial climb all looked exactly as it should for a 707. But as the plane entered its second turn, the heading data shows that the rate of change of the heading was very erratic. In its final moments, the plane was turning faster than it should. Soon, the data engraved in the metal foil of the flight data recorder stopped making sense altogether. It suggested that the plane went through turns that should be impossible for a 707. This was because of the high bank angle of the plane in its final moments. The gyroscopes in the plane just couldn't work in the extreme bank that the plane was in. The data backed up what the eyewitnesses had seen. Flight 1 had dropped out of the skies of New York. The investigators probed the history of the airplane. The plane had an issue with asymmetric spoiler deployments. Faulty maintenance was done on the right-wing spoilers, which caused issues with their deployment. However, the issue was fixed and the plane was put back into service. It made 13 additional flights with no issues whatsoever. The engines also checked out. They were fine with no issues to be found. They studied the recovered wreck of the plane and the control surfaces, like the ailerons, while heavily damaged, showed no signs of an in-flight failure. They studied the wreckage brought up for any signs as to what happened, and they ruled out an in-flight fire. They ruled out the spoilers, the ailerons, the hydraulics. Their list of potential suspects was starting to get smaller and smaller. On the 707, there's a yaw gyroscope and a pitch gyroscope. They sensed the orientation of the plane, 
The result of these gyros are turned into electrical signals, and that's what's sent to the motors that drive the large control surfaces on the plane, like the rudder. So that's where they turn their attention next. The gyros were badly damaged, and their frames were bent out of shape. All the servo motors were recovered. The servo motors looked okay. They were water damaged, but not fire damaged. They went through each servo motor one by one. They finally got to a servo motor whose exterior housing was damaged. The damage was so bad that its internal components were showing. When they checked the circuitry of this particular servo motor, they found that it was an open circuit. Or in other words, the wiring was faulty. I mean, that's not too surprising. The plane did nosedive into the ocean. Some wires were severed, and some wires were flattened in a very peculiar way. Some looked pinched, and some looked like they had been cut by something sharp. The investigators were onto something. They looked at the area where the wires were housed. Maybe something broke off and damaged the wires in the impact sequence. Looking at the place where the wires were, they couldn't see anything that could damage the wires in this way. The wires were not damaged in the crash. In addition to that, they found small scratches on the motor itself. And what did the servo motor control? The rudder. To see if the scratches on the servo motor were unique, they compared it to other motors on the plane and to a few motors in American Airlines' stock. Some of the other servo motors showed the same kind of scratches, and the wire sleeves on those motors had been damaged as well. Unsettlingly, the damage on all the motors were in the exact same place. One of the motors had a seal showing that it had not been opened since it left the factory. Whatever happened, happened there. They found that at the factory, the Bendix Corporation who made the servo motors used tweezers when tying the wire bundles to the motor housing, and that caused the damage to the wires. The manufacturer refuted these claims saying that had the wires been severed, then the unit would not pass the electrical checks that they had at the factory. So they maintained that the damage was due to flying debris during the crash. But the damage was slight at first, and the wires were installed into the servo motors that controlled the rudder. Then, over time, the rigors of flight wore the damaged wires down, eventually separating them. So what happens when these wires break? You'd lose the yaw damper. The yaw damper is used to cancel out the yawing motion of the aircraft. Think of it like the autopilot, but for the rudder. That wouldn't be obvious to the pilots because of how slow they were flying. That's not good, but it's not catastrophic. So what happens if the wires short-circuited? To find out exactly what would happen, the Civil Aviation Board ran tests. They found what they had been looking for. If a blue or an orange wire, also known as the 18-volt excitation lead, made contact with a brown wire, it would lead to a yaw damper or rudder hard over to one side meaning that the plane would be sent into a roll that would be very hard to recover from. Since this was the 1960s, they decided to take a 707 into the air and to then simulate a rudder hardover. In tests, they found that the plane could reach bank angles of about 56 degrees in about 5.5 seconds. They could only recover if they used the ailerons to counter the roll, but the pilots in the test flight knew what they were getting themselves into. The pilots of Flight 1 had little warning if any. Another thing to note is that the pilot in this situation might use the rudder to counter the roll, but that only works if you apply enough pressure to overcome the servo motor. In the test flight, they found that the pilot needed to apply 75 pounds or 35 kilos of force to overpower the servo. If you didn't apply that much force, the servo motor would win out. Another thing that had to happen for a recovery was a quick diagnosis of the problem. On flight 1, that took a while, and that delay ate into the time that they had to save the plane. On flight 1, the yaw damper was only deactivated very late into the accident sequence. But by then, the plane was flying in a way that it was not meant to fly in, and the plane was being buffeted by an impending stall. So what changed due to this? The FAA mandated inspections on all 707s to see if they had damaged servo motors and wire bundles. They also set out to ensure quality control in the manufacture of airplanes so that something like this would never happen again. The last change was to figure out a way by which pilots could have a bit more time to diagnose and fix issues on these swept-wing high-speed jets. That's the story of American Airlines Flight 1. Do you think that the industry and the manufacturers learn from their mistake? And if you have any incident that you'd like me to cover, 
do let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.